Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. When I was a child, one of my favorite people was my Aunt Julia. She was my mother's oldest sister and lived alone in the big billowing house in which she and my mother and their siblings had been raised. Now, Aunt Julia was something of a free spirit. She didn't believe in bedtimes or alarm clocks. Instead of planning her meals, she preferred to ask herself what she wanted to eat when she got hungry and then to eat whatever that was. You can imagine how loved she was by those of us who were children. She insisted on buying us toys and taking us on trips even if our parents felt she might be spoiling us. Her response was always, life is hard. Let them have joy while they can. Life had been hard for my aunt. She had once been a prize-winning photographer, but crippling arthritis and type 1 diabetes had taken her career from her. By her late 40s, as her eyesight was failing, she was confined to a life of disability and dependence upon others. I'm sure there were moments when she was angry and despondent, but she never revealed them to me or to my sister or to any of her nieces and nephews. To us, she was always filled with joy and generosity. My sister and I would beg our parents to let us go and stay with Aunt Julia, usually for several weeks during the summer. Our parents would give in to our pleadings and off we would go. Those days with her were spent playing in the orchards behind her house and eating hamburgers and hot dogs from her favorite restaurants and watching TV together. Her favorite shows were Perry Mason and What's My Line? Now, long since out of production, reruns of those shows were aired during the afternoons on a local independent TV station, and we never missed them. I was particularly fond of What's My Line. Contestants would come out and be introduced by name to a panel of celebrities, and then the panel would have up to 10 questions to figure out the contestant's occupation or claim to fame. We as the audience knew the answer, but hilarity would ensue as the panelists struggled to figure out the truth. As I was reading the gospel this week, memories of those days with Aunt Julia spent watching What's My Line came back to me. There's a real sense in which the disciples have been trying to answer that very question about Jesus. Who is he? What's he really trying to do? For the most part, the disciples, like the crowds, have been deeply impressed by Jesus' ability to heal those who were ill, and they've been moved by his compassion for others. They've never seen anything quite like it. And then there's his courage in speaking truth to power, especially to the religious and political leaders, to a people who struggled under the crushing weight of occupation by a foreign power, Jesus' words bring hope and a measure of satisfaction. Finally, someone is willing to say what needs to be said. To others, though, who never quite measured up to the standards of righteousness outlined by the Pharisees and the scribes, Jesus' words bring a measure of grace and comfort. Finally, someone has recognized them as beloved children of God. These attributes and actions moved many and swelled the crowds that followed Jesus. As we've seen in previous verses, their numbers grew to the point where it became difficult for Jesus to find even a few minutes for rest and renewal. And yet, from the very beginning, there have been hints that all will not end well. 
early in Mark's gospel after a man, after Jesus healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, Mark tells us that the religious and political leaders began to plot Jesus' death. They see Jesus as a threat to their power and to the fragile peace with Rome. And in their view, only his death can prevent another rebellion and more bloodshed. The disciples have been oblivious to these shadows hanging over Jesus' ministry. That's one of the most obvious characteristics of the disciples in Mark's gospel. They just don't get it. They don't get what Jesus is trying to teach them, and they don't get its implications for their lives or the life of the world. That's why this encounter at Caesarea Philippi is such a powerful and transformative moment in the gospel. Caesarea Philippi was historically a shrine to the Greek god Pan, but Herod's son Philip had transformed it into a temple to the emperor and humbly added his own name to the place as well. There, Caesar was worshipped as a deity, as the incarnation of God in human flesh. Devout Jews, of course, detested the place, which is why the Romans and their Palestinian collaborators so often imprisoned, tortured, and executed Jewish prisoners there. For Jesus to ask that probing question of the disciples about who he really is here is to some extent a test of their commitment. It's easy to follow a popular and charismatic leader when the crowds are huge and offering their adulation, but, but what about the deeper questions about where all of this is going and what it could cost? At first, of course, the disciples respond simply by affirming that Jesus stands in this long line of teachers sent by God. Some say you're Elijah, some say you're John, or maybe one of the other prophets. That's all well and good, but Jesus presses further, who do you say that I am? Peter, who is ever that forward one, often speaking without fully understanding the words coming out of his own mouth, offers, you are the Messiah. Those are powerful and subversive words. To confess Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, is to confess that the way taught by Jesus brings salvation and wholeness to the exclusion of the ways of the world, especially to the ways of the emperor and the empire. That's why Peter's confession is so important, and it's also why Jesus immediately warns the disciples not to talk about this with anyone else. Jesus knows that this confession, this statement, will be seen as sedition by the religious and political authorities. That's also why he launches into this warning for the disciples. If you're going to follow you need to understand where this road leads, and that's to the cross. The powers that be have everything invested in preserving the status quo, that fragile peace with Rome that hinges on a clear separation between religion and politics. Jesus' very existence not only threatens that fragile peace, but it promises to utterly destroy it. God isn't interested in preserving the status quo, but in turning it upside down and remaking the world. But Peter, God love him, just can't wrap his head around all of this. As if anyone, any one of us really could. So Peter immediately rebukes Jesus. Now, the word that's used there is the same word that's used for exorcisms in the New Testament. Peter literally thinks that an evil spirit has possessed Jesus and commands it to come out of him. And Jesus responds with just as harsh a retort, calling Peter Satan or the accuser. The way ahead will be hard enough. 
but Peter's words touch on that painful struggle going inside, going on inside Jesus' own heart and mind. And that's why Jesus commands Peter to be quiet. There is no way to escape the struggle that lies ahead. As we have heard from Isaiah's powerful words about the suffering servant, there is a cost to challenging the status quo, and it must be paid. Jesus knows that even as he struggles to accept it. That's why he warns the disciples that they must understand what they're getting into. If they're going to follow him from here on in the journey, they need to understand that this road goes straight to the cross. If you're not ready to walk that way, then Jesus is hinting that now would be a good time to walk away. I thought about these words so often over the last few months, especially as I've listened to so many people who claim to be Christians in our society screaming about how their freedoms are being taken away by being asked to get vaccinated and wear a mask. If we can't get a simple shot or put a simple piece of cloth over our mouth and nose, then how can we possibly walk with Jesus in the way of the cross? To confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord is to embrace the way of the cross, of putting the good of others ahead of one's own comfort. As the writer of James has consistently reminded us in these weeks of readings from that epistle, It's not enough to confess our faith. We have to actually live it out in how we care for others. Theologian Alan Brem writes, Jesus not only taught us, he showed us that the only way to truly live is to give yourself away for the sake of others. If we have the courage to follow him, then we will find that this path of self-giving is the way to true freedom and true joy. And all the life that God wants to give us each and every day. Some of you may have watched the 9-11 tributes that were on television yesterday. Most of them focus on the main memorial that's there, the big gaping hole that is a water fountain. But there's a powerful statue at the World Trade Center Memorial in New York, one that is often not shown or talked about much anymore. It's a simple Latin cross formed by the charred and now rusty remains of steel supports from one of the Twin Towers. That cross was found by firefighters as they searched for survivors and remains in the days just after the collapse of those buildings. It quickly became a symbol for the aching loss felt by all who were connected to that place. And it also became a symbol of hope in the midst of all that suffering. Life is filled with crosses, with suffering, and with struggle. But the good news of the gospel is that it's also filled with the presence of the eternal and everlasting one, the one who stands with us in every circumstance and who is constantly leading us to the cross and beyond to eternal and everlasting life for all. Amen.